Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My, uh, my wife really messed up today. Um, She, um, she got me a card. Um, I got a card by my, my stuff this morning, um, you know, where my keys and my wallet and stuff would be. Then I go to my truck, and there was a, a card in my truck, okay? And then uh, we'd all come into church. My, my daughter and her friend Taylor were coming in with Kathy, my, daughter, my wife, and um, we're walking into church, and my wife, you know, was like, did you get my card, okay, was what she wanted to ask. What she said was, did you get my VD card, of course, my daughter is horrified by such a, <laughs> like, what? <laughs> anyway, it's a bad, it was, it was, it was she, she messed up a lot. So, and then my daughter's even more horrified that I mentioned it in front of everybody. Okay, that's even, that's even, which is the only reason I did it, which is awesome. So, anyway, uh, <laughs> good morning. We're grateful you're here today. And uh, it just so happened that on Valentine's Day, we're going to talk about love today. Loving God, loving people. Good morning, Staunton and our iCampus and and um, open your Bibles with me to Matthew 22. There's two passages I'm going to use today, um, but I need to kind of set the tone. And, and I want to go a little deeper. And what we're going to talk about at one level is very surfacey for the church and for our church specifically. Okay, our mission statement, if you, for lack of our terminology, is loving God, loving people. Okay, that how we think about it is that you can boil the entire scripture down to two concepts, four words, love God, love people. If you love God and you love people, according to Jesus, it's all going to be taken care of. Okay, that what we're supposed to do is love God and love people. All the other things kind of fall underneath those issues, okay, which I'm going to read to you in a second. However, before you check out and go, I've heard that concept before, I hope we get a little deeper than that today. I hope that you allow the Holy Spirit to stir you a little different maybe today because it's not the concept of loving God and loving people. It's actually loving God and loving people. And what does that look like? And, I, and hopefully someplace maybe in contrast what it looks like to hate God and hate people as well. So um, let me kind of read this passage to you. Um, Matthew chapter 22, verse 34. So Jesus is the one he's going to be questioned by the Pharisees, which is kind of the religious leaders of the day. He'd already talked to the Sadducees, okay, which is like a, if you think about them, like is, is, a, is the other group of that. Anyway, hearing that the Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. And that word silence actually menders, actually, actually menders, actually means renders speechless, okay? Not silence as in shut up. Silence is in, he, made a, he said something, and they just went, uh, we had nothing else to say. Okay? That Jesus, his response to the Sadducees rendered them speechless. That's what it says. The Sadducees got together, the Pharisees got together, verse 35. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with, with this question. Now, the whole phrase, okay, I got him now. The expert in the law stepped up, I got this. Okay? Um, teacher. Which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, in their culture, um, you know, the Old Testament and how they believed, there were 613 different laws, okay? Some thou shalt not, some, some thou shalt, okay? There were negative laws and positive laws, things you should do and things you shouldn't do, but there were 613 total. It had been, if he had said, if he had answered the questions and one of those laws were greater, then it would have been a problem for them because they didn't believe that. And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, and your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Again, that one statement silenced them. Because what he was saying was, take your 613 laws... Take anything God ever says or anything God ever does. Take anything ever written in Scripture. It falls really under two categories. It's either all about loving God or it's all about loving people. And that's how simple he made it. It takes a, a complicated concept of, you know, theology or understanding Scripture or what's it mean to follow God or how do I know God's will or any of those kind of topics. And it says, let's make it really simple for you. Just love God with all of your heart, your soul, and your mind and love other people. Love your neighbor as yourself. Everything else that God said hangs on one of those two commandments. So we've heard that. We've talked about that at our church a lot, and I've kind of dug into that passage a little bit. 
Go with me to another passage we've used a great deal, and that is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse, um, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, or if the new creation has come and the old has gone, the new is here. All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, pause that. Keep your fingers. I'm coming right back to that. Number one in the outline is at the end of the day, we have a simple mission. At the end of the day, we have a simple mission. Our mission, okay? Now, as a church, this is our mission, but as an individual follower of Christ, okay? If you just, as an individual person, that when you really get simple, it's like we can use, we have other phrases we use and we think, you know, we're trying to help, you know, our, like we have a target of reaching unchurched, de-churched people, all these kind of phrases, right? But at the end of the day, our mission is to love God with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind and love neighbors, love our people, our, love people as ourselves, to value others beyond ourselves and to be an expression of God's love around us. It's not any more complicated than that. Now, the problem is, is that, you, you know, you've heard me talk about before how Satan, um, Satan loves to distort. Satan doesn't create anything. He distorts. Okay, God is the creator. And so God is the one who says, okay, let there be and then it becomes. Okay, he's the one who created everything that's been created. That was God. But then what Satan does, he wants to come around and he wants to distort that so that it is damaged so that it's used for wrong purposes, so that it does, does harm rather than good, or whatever the phrase is, okay? So just any topic you want to pick, this, this applies to everything. God creates it, Satan distorts it. Um, love is one of those topics. That God is the one who is love. It's not that God loves, I mean, it's, it's the persona, it's, a, it's the personhood of God that he is love. But yet, in our world, in the culture we live in, we are really messed up in the area of love. We have no idea what that means. I mean, we think we do. You know, you know it's the, it's the, you know, the 14-year-old girl who thinks she's in love, we know that's not right, right? And it's the, it's the 27-year-old person who is starving for love, we know that's unhealthy. And it's the 47-year-old who thinks there's no such thing as love, really. That really, if we're honest, you can't trust anybody. And we're carrying around such hurt and such pain. We exchange, instead of love, we think, well, sex must be love. Or whatever. We think that if we say nice things or buy nice things or do nice things, that must be love. We don't understand love. And the reason we don't understand love is not because it's a bad thing. It's because Satan has distorted it. It's because our woundedness and our pain and the way we responded, we have really messed it up. I mean, like I, I teach when, in the area, when I talk to our teenagers about dating and stuff like that, what I always tell them is, is that if you're a guy, that you should treat every girl like you want someone to treat your daughter or your sister. And if you're a girl, you ought to treat every guy the way you want somebody to treat your son or your brother. Now just think about that for a second. That's a pretty simple concept, right? But yet, many times, the guy who is trying to see how many girls he can sleep with, when it's time for, it's, we're talking about his sister, or know about his daughter, uh, they want to kill people. Huh? Yes? Am I getting too close? Now, the point I'm trying to make is, is that that's just an example. I'll give a lot of others. Is that we don't understand. We don't get that, that love. Okay, to love someone is more about being selfless than selfish. 
We, what we do is we tend to love things, whatever it is we love, okay? We love, I love, name the thing. It's because of what it does for me. Like, how many of you love steak? Only because of what it does for you. Right? I mean, if you really love steak, would you kill a cow? No, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the point I'm making is, is that we, the things we love, okay, now, that I was being facetious with something like, you know, like food, right? But whether it's vehicles, you love your, name the th- anything you, and then add an object. Okay, I love my truck. Well, why? Because what it does for me, right? Not because I love my truck. I love my truck because it does for me. Remember, if I love my truck that much, I would keep it in some kind of pristine place so it never got dirty, it never got miles on it, so it just stay around forever, I, I will, eventually, I'm going to devalue my truck to the place that I want to get rid of and get a new one. Because I love what my truck does for me. And when it stops doing that for me, or when it starts costing me more money per month than I think it's worth, it's out of here. Now, let's go to people. If you're honest, many times we struggle with exactly the same thing toward people. Not just family or husbands and wives or boyfriends and girlfriends, but just people in general. We love them many times for what they've done for us. And that is a form of love. That is a reason to love. That's a part of love, right? But biblical love, godly love is really, I love you regardless of what you've done for me. Even though you've caused me pain, I choose to love you. I'm not going, and there's lots of forms of that. We're not holding someone's sin against them, choosing to forgive them. There's lots of phrases that, that we don't say the word, I love that person, but when we choose to do those things, we are showing love. My point about that whole thing, and I can spend a lot of time there, but I won't, is that our mission is simple. We are to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind. Jesus would say, if you love me, obey me. Every time we struggle with obedience, we're struggling with love. Jesus wants us to worship him. Worship is the extension of love. That's what it means. The definition is it's the extension of love. It's extending love to God. When we struggle with worship, when we struggle with praise, when we struggle with sacrifice, when we struggle with surrender, all those kind of phrases... It's really our struggle is we don't love God enough. When God asks us to do something and we say no or, well, I just don't feel comfortable. I mean, my, my fear, my, my, what the thing we name is, right? My schedule, my whatever it is. Anytime we do that, we're elevating something else above God. And at the end of the day, we're saying we love him, but he knows better. I love you, but not like I do my daughter. That makes sense to you? We say to God, well, God, I love you, but not like I love this. Man, my, my, my comfort zone is more important to me or my, you know, my, 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 not, my not stretching myself or not being uncomfortable, not looking awkward or not being, you know, my addiction, my, my whatever it is, my excuse, my, the thing I don't want to give up yet. And sometimes we get ourselves caught in this deal of, well, I want to take my next step, but I just can't. Well, what that means is there's something I think I need to stop doing first and I'm not willing to stop doing that yet. What does that say? What does it mean? It means that there's something I'm loving more than I love God. I'm not willing to let go yet. I mean, I want to be the bride of Christ. I want to be married to Jesus. But I'm not willing to let go of my old girlfriend or my old boyfriend. I'm not willing to let go of my old habits or my old coping mechanisms. I'm not willing to let go of my old excuses, my old pain, my old woundedness. I'm not willing to let go of my comfort. I'm not willing to let go of my whatever the thing is. Therefore, from God's perspective, he don't really love me. And we're supposed to love people. What it says is, love your neighbor as yourself. Can we just be honest for a second that many of us, maybe most of us, don't really love ourselves very much either. In many of our cases, we are the most negative voice in our life. 
I mean, we beat ourselves down mentally. We have those whispers. You're, you're, you're a punk. You're a loser. You're never getting, you'll never get past that. Whatever it is, right? We sell ourselves short. When we let fear control us, what do you think you're doing? You're selling yourself short. Well, I just can't do that. Really? Is that a true statement or is that just a mental lie? Well, I just can't overcome that. I just can't fix that. My life will never be different than that. I, okay, is that true? I mean, really true? Or is that just something that you've allowed to imprison you for ever how many years? But what he says is love your neighbor as yourself. We're supposed to learn to love ourselves. And whether the words like acceptance or understanding God's forgiveness, like I talk to a lot of people about forgiveness, and they'll be like, well, I, I, I believe it's, it's easier for us to believe God can forgive us than we can forgive ourselves. Does that make any sense? Like our threshold of forgiving ourselves is greater than what God's threshold of forgiveness is, which makes no sense at all, but that's how we think sometimes. And our regret and our shame and our guilt and our whatever, and we just don't want to accept ourselves. I don't have time to talk about that today, but just put Paul's that. So the point is, we're supposed to love people. You can't really love people the way you're supposed to love people if you don't first understand God's love for you and learn to love yourself. And we don't really love people. We just struggle with that. We love people as long as they're doing things we want them to do. See, here's what it says back in the Second Corinthians passage. That when I come to Christ, in verse 17, when I give my life to Christ, I am a new creation. That something new is taking place in me. It doesn't mean it's happened in past tense. It means it happened and it's continuing to happen. I mean, the, the whole concept of being a follower of Christ isn't you're saved and then you're perfect. It is you are now saved. You have a relationship with Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God indwells you. And from that moment forward, he is transforming you for the rest of your life. That you are constantly in process of being made a brand new creation. That today, I've been saved for you know, decades now, right? That I am in Christ and I am a new creation. I wasn't made a new creation, you know, 30 years ago or 40 years ago or 50 years ago where it was. I wasn't made a new creation way back here, and therefore I'm just living off of that. I was made a new creation way back there when I chose Christ my Savior and the Holy Spirit and dwelt me. And then from that day forward, he has been transforming me from the inside out. And there have been times I grieved and quenched the Spirit of God, and I would not allow him to work in me. And there's times he withdrew, and there's times that I had consequences and punishment and all those kind of phrases you go through. And there's times I had to choose repentance and all that kind of stuff. And all along the way, God was working in me to make me a brand new creation. And so today, I can tell you that when I get up in the morning, that God will be working on me tomorrow to make me a brand new creation. That I am always in process of being made new. And any one of you who know Christ is. And all the old stuff is being washed away. That what was old what was broken, what was wounded, what was filled with pain, what was filled with rejection, what was filled with lies, that God wants to remove that? And then he says that all of that is from God. In other words, we can't do anything. What he's really saying is when it says all that is from God who reconciled him, us to himself in Christ, he's saying you can't do anything. You can't, so when I say this, well, I wanna take my next step, but I gotta fix this first. Then you don't understand the gospel very well. God never says, Tim, when you fix all your stuff, you come to me. God says, you come running to me, and I will transform you. I will, quote, not fix your stuff. I will resolve. I will remove your stuff. It's a whole different concept. Well, but I need to, present, I need to bring myself presentable to God. What? No, you present yourself to God. You're never presentable to God. Are you tracking? The, you know, the whole word of righteousness, the, the, the concept is I am presentable to God. I'm only presentable to God, you're only presentable to God as a follower of Christ, as, as, as in Christ, because of Jesus, we are accepted. Outside of Jesus, I don't care how wonderful, how perfect, how together you are, I don't care what you think about yourself, you're never presentable to God. That our righteousness according to Scripture, according to God's word, is like filthy rags, 
We're never presentable to God. But as we present ourselves to him with all of our brokenness and all of our pain and all of our coping mechanisms and all of our lies and all of our stuff, we present ourselves to God. Then God is the one who works in us, then his Holy Spirit, to transform us from the inside out. Our job is not to have it together. Our job is to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and to love people as ourselves. Our mission is very simple. Now, number two in the outline, um, the needs around us are obvious. So we have a simple mission, but you look around you, the needs are everywhere, right? Um, Sometimes the ways we hate God, like our terminology, is, um, you know, we deny him, we disobey him, words like that. Sometimes we, really, really, we hate people is we see needs all around us and we don't respond to them. Or we get desensitized to the needs around us and therefore we don't even want to respond to them. Well, we, we don't hate people, and that's how we talk about it. From God's perspective, if we're not his hands and feet, we're hating the people around us. I mean, that's, that's how God would process that. Like, it's, it's like, well, when we read verse 14, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14, it says it this way. For Christ's love, so it means God's love through Christ in us, the love of Christ indwelling us, in us, the Spirit of God in us, and exhibiting the love of Christ, compels us. That word compel, it means that we don't have a, it's just like a compulsion. It, it's, it's something that shoots you out. You don't have a choice even compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. So when God stirs your heart to be a good inviter, let's say. I mean, in the story we just listened to from uh, Sarah's story, if Cindy Campbell had not been a good inviter... She told you, I, I, for several, several years, how many Christ followers crossed her path in several years and weren't good inviters? And if she had died in a car accident before she met Cindy, what would have happened? And didn't you hear her say, I, I always felt rejected. I felt judged, or whatever phrase she used. So God stirs your heart to be a good inviter. God stirs your heart to tell your story to someone. God stirs your heart to, whatever the phrase is, right? And eh, I don't want to, I'm just too busy. I don't wanna make a fool of myself, they might reject me. What you're doing is, is you're hating people. And not, not how we would define hating, but biblically speaking. You love yourself. You love your fear of rejection. You love not putting yourself out on a limb. You love, whatever that phrase is, not risking something more than you love Christ and more than you love people. None of us want to charge into a burning building. If your child is in that burning building, you have no problems charging into the burning building. You know what I'm saying? It's about love, not about fear. Because love overcomes fear. What if the love of Christ in you, if you just allowed it to compel you? What would be different about your life? Let me go back to the end of that chapter. So verse 18 again. All of this is from, from God who reconciled himself through Christ, or us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. But that whole compulsion thing is God, here's what this is, it's God stirring your heart to do what he's asking you to do. Okay, here's, okay. God already did it for you, okay? So it'd be like, we're gonna have a party at my house, okay? And I call you on the phone and say, hey, would you get my party? You say, I would love to come to your party. I say, great, great, you're in. And I call you on the phone and say, hey, would you invite a couple more people? 
All right, here's who I want you to invite. And then you say, nope, I'm not going to invite nobody. And then we show up to the party, just me and you. I invited you and asked you to invite others. Why is it just the two of us? Now, here's what we know, okay? What we know is, is that you dropped the ball. Yes? I mean, that was your job. You had one job. I'm providing everything else. I'm the one in charge of the banquet. I'm going to have a spread. I'm going to have food. I'm going to have all kinds of stuff. It's going to be awesome. Just invite these people for me, would you? Yep, got you. Well, I didn't want them to tell me no. All I'm saying to you is, is that when you take it from a human perspective into God, it's the same way. Is that God has reconciled us to himself and then has in turn given us the message of reconciliation. It goes in and says that we are the ambassadors of Christ. Like you're the ambassador of my party. I've invited you and I'm asking you to be my ambassador. I, I can't go do it. I'm really busy. I'm out of the country, whatever it is, right? I can't go do this. I'm asking you on my behalf to go invite people to come to my party. The church as a whole individuals, that's what the church is, not the building, not the organization, you, I, we are the church, that we have been given a message of reconciliation, that God reconciled me, Tim wrote us, to himself in Christ, and then gave to me a ministry, a, a, a calling, a whatever you want to call that, to reconcile others, to be a part of the process of inviting people to Jesus' party. And every single one of us who knows Christ our Savior, now if you don't know Christ your Savior, <coughs> this part does not apply to you yet. But every one of us who says the Spirit of God lives inside of us, and if we die today, we'll spend eternity in heaven, that we are followers of Christ, every single one of us has been entrusted by God the ministry of reconciliation. Everybody. And the things that stand in the way in that are things that say, I love that more than I love the God who gave me an assignment. And the minute of reconciliation is so awesome. I mean, I would hate it if it was. You know what? Clean up your act, and then we can come to see God. You know, John, I, I want to see you in heaven. I'd love to see you come to my church. But you know, you, you can't come to my church. You can't come to heaven. You, you're messed up, brother. When you get past all your stuff, you get past all of your pain, all of your addictions, all your questions, all the lies, when you get past all of your inhibitions, when you get past all your stuff, then come talk to me. And then I'll see if I can work out a deal with you and God. That is not what God said. The message God gave us, it says right here, I mean, this is, I'm reading black and white, right? What it says is, is that God has entrusted us, the message of reconciliation, verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them. So I have a message. I can look you in the eye. I'm not making this stuff up. I can tell you, listen, stop trying to fix yourself. Stop trying to fix your marriage. Stop trying to fix your brokenness. Stop trying to fix your lies. Stop trying to fix your whatever it is. Stop trying to fix it because Jesus wants to fix it. Come to him. He will take care of it for you. He won't, now, somebody says, well, I know so-and-so goes to church. They're still a hypocrite in their faith. Coming to church is not the same as having a transforming relationship with Jesus Christ. Being saved is not the same as letting the Spirit of God transform you from the inside out. Being committed to attending church is not the same as choosing repentance and laying your life down before God and saying, God, here I am. Change me, use me, search me. It's not the same. That God, was not, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sin against them. But Tim, you know what I did? It doesn't matter. Why not? Because that happened, that was all taken care of a cross. You were judged. Now, there are consequences for our sin, our choices, right? I mean, there are things we do and there's, you know, you, you can't say the cop who stops you for speeding and say, oh, dude, I'm already forgiven for this. <laughs> right? That doesn't work that way, okay? But the sin was forgiven at a cross, between you and the you know, police officer pulled you off for the ticket, there's a consequence for your speeding. Between you and God, there, 
You're forgiven at the cross. God doesn't hold that against you. He's already reconciled you. Uh, not came in sin against them, and has committed to us the mess of reconciliation. We are therefore, verse 20, Christ's ambassadors. As if God was making his appeal through us. Get your head around that for a second. He goes on and says that the, the one who God called, it, the one who became sin, he knew no sin, but he became sin so that God could reconcile us. And then he made us the ambassador. We're the inviters to the party. That's how it's supposed to work. If we choose not to, we don't love God and we don't love people. No, 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 I love God, I love people. That's a lie. If you don't invite people to the party, if you don't live a life of obedience and surrender, you don't really love God and you don't really love people. Hmm. That wasn't very nice, was it? If we're so carried up in ourselves, in our busy schedules, in our agendas, in our opinions, in our fears, in our worries, in our excuses, in our laziness, in our procrastination. That we are not somehow engaged in inviting people to the party then we do not love God. And we do not love people. When you hear me pray prayers like, I pray almost every Sunday, God, give us eyes to see what you see and a heart to feel what you feel. That's what I'm praying. See, I can't really love people until I am overwhelmed by the love of God. It's as God overwhelms me with his love. As I start to see things the way God sees them instead of how I see them, because I see them, I, I, I'm, I'm oblivious too. I don't want to pay attention. I mean, there's needs all around us. I'm too busy, man. I got stuff going on, and I am. And it's not a lie. You're not lying when you say that. But the point is, is that that's because I don't see what God sees. And when I do see it, I don't feel the way God feels about it. You ready? The person who angers you, is it possible that God's heart is broken over them? The person who frustrates you, who hurts you, is it possible that what God wants to do is use you and your voice to say to them, listen, there's a better way. God's not holding your sin against you. Is it possible that God wants to use your hands to be the one who meets a need of the people or a person who lives around you? Now, God will use us to reach people, but he uses you to reach a person. Without the capacity, we'll never have capacity to love people until we're first really overwhelmed by the love of God for us. You have to come across your sin. I was really a bad guy. I was a really bad woman. No, I was really good. Okay, you're good compared to people in the world, maybe. You're not good compared to God's standards. Your sins separate you from God. And God wants to use you to draw people to himself. Number three, the authority and power and hope is real. Matthew 28, 
And you know, Jesus said, all power and all authority has been given to me, therefore you go, make disciples, baptize and teaching, preach, that kind of stuff, right? He's saying everything that God has been given to me. You can read that again, like in Ephesians chapter one, verse 18 through 23, and now through there, you know, you know all power been given to Jesus. And it says for, it actually says the phrase, for the church, that God gave Jesus all, every, you know, power, gave him a name of every name, gave him all power, all authority, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for the church. You know, Acts chapter one, verse eight says that when the Holy Spirit indwells you, when he lives inside of you, you will receive the Holy Spirit and then you'll have the power to be the witnesses of Christ. So the power to be the ambassador of Jesus is the person the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You ready? To not do that is gonna be grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit. If you go to a restaurant, right? You go to a restaurant, you sit down, you expect, I'm gonna just say it's a restaurant that they have waiters and waiters come, actually come to you, right? You go in and you sit down, then you expect them to bring you a menu, right? They have an expectation that if you came in, they expect you to take a menu and order something or say, hey, I'll have the usual, whatever it is. You would think it was really weird and be upset, matter of fact, if you went and sat down in a restaurant and the waiter or waitress never came to see you. If they never came and said, hey, here's the menu, what would you like, let me tell you about the specials today, you'd be, you might, you would never go back to that restaurant again maybe. The normal expectation of going to a restaurant is that we're going to go there to eat and we're gonna buy food from the people who own the restaurant. The normal expectation when you ask Christ to be your savior is not that I just don't wanna to go to hell. I just wanna to get to go to heaven. The normal biblical expectation is that the Holy Spirit indwells you, he transforms you from the inside out, and he makes you the ambassador of Jesus, that you become the witness of Jesus. That is the normal expectation. You're not supposed to be left the same way. Now you have the power to say to the waitress, no, nah, I'm not gonna order anything, just give, me, just give me a cup of coffee today. That's all I do. You have the power to say that. But that's not the normal expectation. You have the power to say to God, you know what? I'm gonna grieve and quench your Holy Spirit. I don't want him to use me. I don't want him to transform me. I don't want him to be different in me. I wanna be exactly how I've always been, just a little bit better version, and I wanna to go to heaven instead of hell when I die. That's really all I care about. You have the power to say that. I mean, I guess. If you wanna live without hope, without power, without transformation, without the presence of God actually operating in your life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. See, the power, the hope, the authority, those are real. I mean, I can go to the Bible, and I can get all these verses and just tell you how real they are. It's not the capability for you as an individual, for us as a church family to do what God's called us to do. It's not the capability, the power, the authority, the hope. It's the availability. It's the willingness. The thing is not what, you know, well, I don't know if God can do that or not. Yes, God can, that's very clear what God can do. We as a church have a long list of examples of what God has done, okay? It is doing and is going to do in the future. The question is not can God. The question is are we willing to see it happen in us? It's about, not about capability, it's about availability. Number four, love reflects the heart of God. Love reflects the heart of God. And when the last week about save people serve, serving reflects the heart of God, not volunteering, serving reflects the heart of God. Loving God, loving people, love reflects the heart of God. That's what God wants to do is love people. Selflessly, not selfishly. What we tend to want to do is be a reservoir. You know, a pool, a pond of God's love, God's forgiveness, words like that, right? And God wants us to be a stream. Now let me ask you a simple question. Is the power of the water in being dammed up and turned into a reservoir, or is the power of the water when it flows? The power of the water is in the flow. Right? The power of God, the power of the Spirit of God, whatever term you want to use, the power of love is not in us res reservoiring it up, you know, damming it up somehow and then you get this big pile of it, right, saved up. That's not, that, what that does is calls, it causes rust. The power of the love of God, just like with the water, is the flow. It's not that we have a whole bunch of it saved up, it's that it just keeps coming and never stops. It's the pond just sitting there becomes stagnant. 
Many people who go to church, maybe you, your love becomes stagnant. Your passion, be, well, I'm just not passionate like I used to be. That's because you become a reservoir, you're stagnant. Well, I just don't feel the motivation like I used to. That's because you became a reservoir and you got stagnant. That's why you got focused on the wrong things. See, the people who are hot for God, the people who have a passion for serving Christ, the people who are seeing God work in their lives and transform them are not reservoirs. They are rivers. They are streams of living water. The Spirit of God is flowing through them. It's transforming them. It's washing the junk out of the way. The pond just sits there and gets moss on the top. You don't see creeks with moss on the top. You don't see raging rivers with, cross, or with moss on the top. Why not? Because it's all getting moved downstream. And so when I'm set there and I see my, my pain, I see my excuses, and I see my lies, and I see my, my hopelessness, and I see my fears, and I see my anxieties, when I see those things all hanging around me, it's because I become a reservoir, and the Spirit of God is not a stream flowing those things passing out. And number five. The question is our resolve. What or who do you want us to be as a church? Have we arrived for you? Are you happy and comfortable? We've accomplished what they said that we couldn't do. Let me tell you my opinion. And I know we're running out of time, but just bear with me. When we launched to build the building our hurricane property, long before any of us, or most of us were here, that was impossible. That was never going to happen. They were made fun of in this community by people. That was the dumbest idea ever. No banker would give them a loan. They had to mortgage their own homes to get the loan to get that building taken care of. When I came 16 years ago, um, they hadn't grown, you can't grow, yada, 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 yada. And then we started doing things that people said we couldn't do then, except instead of being a building, they were other things. It was. I don't know what you want to call it, but it, it wasn't so much a building people get to see. It's just, I mean, filling parking lots up and all those kind of things. Changing culture, stuff like that. And then God put us on the process of having this building. Again, something big and visual that nobody thought could ever happen. Ever happen. And it did. Okay. And then there was a Staunton campus, and that was visual, and we're there. Because you can't do that. Now, the question is at the Carville campus, now bear with me, I'm not being ugly, just hear me. It's not about the big visual thing, but this is just the visual thing to build our faith because what God wants to do is the things that people can't see. It's still about changing culture, reaching people seeing lives transformed in a much greater way. And I know I'm going along, just bear with me. The, the Carnival campus, or the Hurricane campus, um, they had enough seats to fill the building halfway up when I got there. And those were, we had lots of space. You can't, there's no reason to buy more chairs because we're not going to grow. The experts in the area the, whether it be you know, at the state level of Southern Baptist life or they be pastors in the community or whatever it is, you can't grow a church in a small town. Anyone who's been on that journey realizes we outgrew the building, that we outgrew the parking, that we had no classrooms for adults because it was all filled with children. I mean, you look at that list of stuff, right? We outdid all that. Ready? Now, so that was way back there. That was uh, been there, done that, got the T-shirt. Now we're here. The same liar, the same liar who said to this church back here, you'll never finish that building. Oh, you'll never fill that building. You'll never pay for that building. That building is gonna be a Holiday Inn West. That building will be a big hate barn. 
the same liar that said, you'll never fill it up. The same liar, you'll never get that Walmart building done. It's the same liar who says today, you'll never fill it up. It's the same liar, Staunton Campus, who says to you, you'll never fill it up. It's the same liar who says, video campuses in small towns don't work. It's the same liar that says that little towns and rural communities don't need the gospel. There's not enough people there. They'll never go to church. It's the same liar that tells you that you need to be afraid, that you need to be, uh, you know, somehow fear, fear rejection, that you need to not want to be willing to tell your story. That you, you, that's the same liar. It's not a person. The battle's not with the people, even the people who tell you the stories or the lies. It's not, it's not the people. It's the powers and principalities. The word liar is a capital L. The liar is Satan. He is the liar. And he's the one who whispers, and he's the one who tells you what God can't do. My question is not what God can do. The power is very secure. The authority that he has given us is very secure. The hope that he has given us is very secure. The question is not the capability. The question is my willingness and my availability. Oh, your willingness and your availability too. Staunton Campus, your willingness and your availability So we gotta decide, what do we wanna be? Who do we wanna be? Have we arrived or do we wanna be? I had a guy come in here the other day. He goes, how many seats are that? I told him, you know the number. He goes, how many seats the building hold? I told him the number. He goes, do you think you'll ever need to buy more chairs? I just looked at him. The redneck can be wanna hit him. <laughs> God will forgive me. <laughs> then he said, I look, just look at him. I go, uh, yeah. He goes, you think you'll like, go, ever go to you know, more than one service? If we don't, we have failed. He goes, how can you say that? That'd be a huge success. And I said, if I failed it five or six times, there are still thousands of people living without hope and will spend eternity in hell. He just looked at me like, he, he's a church guy. I, he never had that concept before. <laughs> See, if we think about success, as opposed to loving people and loving God, we're going to settle. We have arrived. We love God who lo we love people who love us. We love God because he does amazing things for us. Look who we are. We are awesome. And all those things are true. Our first song we sang, you know, it kept one of my favorite lines, you know, it says that God works out all things for my good. That's awesome. <clears throat> and it's true. And there have been the darkest moments of my life where I just had to keep repeating that over and over and over and over and reminding myself the truth of Scripture is that no matter how dark the moment is, that God works out all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And I choose to love him, and I'm called according to his purpose, and I'm going to believe that he's going to work out all things for my good. But if that's why I love him, then I don't love him at all. The only reason that promise needs to be in Scripture is for the person who's walking through the darkest day of their life. When you feel abandoned and you feel you've lost everything and you feel that no one matters and no one cares and you feel that, you feel that God's abandoning you or whatever the phrases are, that's the only time you need that verse. It didn't say, I will work out all things if you're just really cool people. I'll work out all things for people who love me and are committed to my purpose. What is our resolve? What is your resolve? If you use my football team, I'd ask you how hard you want to work. I mean, we're going to start a season. Are we trying to win a conference? Are we trying to win a championship? Are we trying to, you know, just have a good time and go out the cheerleader after it's over with? What are we trying to do here? And if a team wants to be lazy, I can't make them work hard. 
but the team wants to work hard, then they win championships. Churches are much the same way. What do you want to be? Who do you want to become? What level of difference do you want to make where God has planted you at? And all you have to do after that is be willing to pay the price. God has the power. He has the authority. He has the hope. He just needs your willingness. That's all. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. So many times we say that, and um, I'm consciously aware that we don't really love you that much. God, I don't, I don't want people to be stirred up by my words. But God, I hope that your spirit spoke. I hope that in the next 20 minutes or so that we choose to lay it down for you, to press into whatever you're asking of us, to lay down, to sacrifice, to choose to obey, to choose to respond exactly how you're asking us to respond. God, we don't want to be okay. We want to be transformed. We want to be comfortable. We want to be a place of hope and restoration where you planted us at. We want to be big. We want to be a river of living water. We want to be a place where the stream is flowing and lives are being changed and all the other stuff is just byproducts of your power. We love you. Help us understand what that even means. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.